Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Tonight, we have another long exploration of space and time ahead. This is going to be an overview of medicine and healing across history and civilizations, from prehistory to present. I will tell you about the techniques and biology. But beyond that, it is also interesting to explore how different cultures have looked at the link between the body and mind, the origins of illness, and what healing actually is. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the description and also pinned in the first comment. Also in the description, you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. But before we begin, assume a comfortable position and take a long, deep, relaxing breath. And when you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders and your neck. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too, and allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. There is very little record of prehistoric medicine and the concepts around it. The first records begin with early civilizations, but there is no doubt that healing practices existed. They are revealed by archaeology and what we know of prehistoric societies. Actually, taking care of the wounded is the old and distinctive characteristic of human beings. At most, a limited number of social mammals, including humans, it is hard to make comparisons with animals, but some social animals do take care of each other, and not only instinctively with their young. For example, adult wolves may lick each other's wounds as part of their social behavior. They don't have medicine, of course, but they form bonds that make them care for each other inside their society. Sometimes the opportunity to recover for an individual, thanks to the help of others, makes the difference between life and death. However, for any kind of medical knowledge to develop, the other important thing is the transmission from one generation to the next. That's actually the big difference between humans and other social animals. In our lifetime, previous generations pass on their knowledge to our generation. We learn languages to communicate. We learn plenty of techniques and behaviors that have been proven for generations. And we transmit them to our children incrementing them with new ones. This is the engine of human technical progress in comparison with all other species. 
You can have hundreds of generations of wolves, of apes, or ants, but they will not progress technically. Because even though individuals may learn things during their lives, they don't transmit them to their offspring. There is no accumulation of knowledge generation after generation upon which future generations could build. In contrast, humans pass on their discoveries and they constantly add more. The fact that we have cars or cell phones today is the product of an extraordinary accumulation of discoveries and knowledge. From fire and metallurgy to mathematics, electricity, chemistry. The generation that produced cell phones combined many different previous inventions or processes that actually began to appear hundreds of generations ago. I'm telling you all this because medical knowledge whatever its form or efficacy, works in a similar way. Generations after generations, in a society or a civilization, practices are passed on because they have been observed and they are believed to work. And yet, another characteristic of human society is that they attribute meaning and interpretation to their practices and what happens in their world. In the case of illness, animals don't ask themselves why they are sick or what causes their state. Humans do. They need causes and reasons. This is why a common point seen in all the cultures we will talk about tonight, is that they find an explanation for illness. It can be spirits, imbalances in the body or the mind, magic or more technical explanations like poison or viruses. Some of these can be believed or not. But in any case, there is this drive to understand and find cures. This is what has always guided the development of medicine. There are signs that this happened long before the first writing systems. On prehistoric sites, remains were found that indicate not just the making of treatments with herbs or clays, but also attempts at dentistry or surgery. The first known dentistry, for example, dates back to about 9,000 years ago, during the Neolithic period. We know this because flint-tipped drills and bowstrings used on teeth were found in the Middle East. The first known trepanation, which refers to the act of making a hole in the skull, possibly to relieve pressure inside the skull, or extract fragments occurred around 7,000 years ago at a prehistoric site in France, possibly even earlier. This is just the oldest archaeological evidence of trepanation. What we also know with a good degree of certainty about prehistoric medicine and societies, at least during the Neolithic period, is that individuals had different social roles, and one of them was a healer. This role was occupied by shamans, who were individuals interacting with spirits or by apothecaries, who oversaw the making and providing remedies using plants. It is unclear to what extent these societies distinguished between magical or religious practices 
and the practice of medicine or the production of medicine and medicinal treatments. In any case, the very blurred line between the two is something characteristic of early civilizations. In ancient Mesopotamia, for example, when a person became ill, doctors would prescribe both magical formulas to be recited as well as medical treatments. The oldest written medical prescription we know of was from Mesopotamia, specifically Sumer, and it was dated to 4,000 years ago. In the following centuries, the first text on medicine, with this mix of magical formulas and medication that were recommended for all kinds of diseases, appeared. Also in Mesopotamia, the Babylonians were the first, along with the Egyptians, which we will discuss shortly, to introduce in the second millennium BC, that is, three to four thousand years ago, the principles of physical examination, diagnosis, prognosis, that is to say the forecast about the patient's evolution, and recipes for remedies. This is important because it shows the conception that illness is not just a state. There are different illnesses, different pathologies, and it was the doctor's role to determine which one it was and what treatment it called for. There is a text called the Diagnostic Handbook which is also the most extensive Babylonian medical text. It presented a list of medical symptoms together with empirical observations about how they can manifest in the patient's body. These symptoms or combination of symptoms pointed to certain illnesses in a very logical, systematic way. We may find the treatments offered not very credible magical formulas, but there were already concepts here that still exist in modern medicine, such as the observation of symptoms, the elaboration of specific treatments for specific illnesses, as well as a search for efficient therapies that actually worked led to the development of various remedies. For instance, there were recipes for herbal treatments and creams with precise proportions that had to be respected. The ancient Mesopotamians also observed that certain sets of conditions favored the spread of certain contagious diseases. Although they did not know why or how this occurred, of course, they pragmatically implemented measures to separate patients from healthy individuals to prevent the spread of diseases. Regarding the attribution of specific illnesses by the Mesopotamians, it is not well documented. It is unclear whether they attributed the appearance of a particular illness to spirits psychological problems or curses even. But in the case of mental illnesses, they believed these disorders were caused by specific deities. Hallucinations or erratic behavior were thought to be brought on by the influence of a god or goddess. Additionally, because hands symbolized control over a person in their culture, they named various mental disorders after specific deities such as the hand of Ishtar or the hand of Shamash and so on. We don't know which illnesses corresponded to these deities. The modern terminology for such conditions, if there was any, but here again, they made distinctions 
and the role of the doctor was to utilize systematic knowledge of symptoms and perform examinations to diagnose the patient, provide a prognosis, and recommend a suitable treatment. In ancient Egypt, medicine shared similarities with Mesopotamia, particularly in the combination of magical practices and the use of plant, mineral, or animal-based recipes that were offered as treatments. The approach, based on observation and diagnosis, referred to as treatment, was further developed by the Egyptians, who delved into detailed studies of pathologies. They produced numerous documents outlining cures and ailments and anatomical observations. The oldest document we know of is called the Edwin Smith Papyrus, dating back to the mid-2nd millennium B.C. However, it was likely a copy of several earlier works that were as ancient as Mesopotamian documents. Imhotep, an important figure in Egyptian medicine, served as the chancellor to Pharaoh Djoser of the Third Dynasty. He might have also been the architect of Djoser's Pyramid, which is renowned for being a large step pyramid, a precursor to the more familiar smooth pyramids constructed during the Fourth Dynasty. The most famous of these pyramids are located in Giza. Djoser lived a few generations earlier, during the Third Dynasty in the 27th century B.C., almost 5,000 years ago. Little is known about the life of Imhotep, the historical character, but over the 3,000 years following his death, he gradually attained a glorified and even deified status as a wise man, and later as a kind of father of medicine. But was he really? It is hard to tell. Determining the accuracy of these claims is challenging since there are no known texts mentioning his name in the first 1,200 years after his death. We know he existed, thanks to contemporary inscriptions that mention his name and establish him as the chancellor to the pharaoh. So it is believed that he was largely forgotten for a considerable period. Imhotep lived during a time when Egypt's most spectacular monuments had yet to be constructed but the country had already achieved unity between the north and south and possessed an ancient culture. But the Egyptian civilization had not yet acquired the brilliance that centuries and centuries of cultural refinement in art and architecture would give it. It was more than a thousand years after his death that the name of Imhotep began to resurface in texts from the 14th century. Subsequently, statues of him were also created. This recognition occurred during the New Kingdom, and Imhotep's fame continued to rise to the extent that he was ultimately venerated as a demigod by the end of the New Kingdom though not primarily as a healer yet, but rather as an extraordinary ancestor and a source of wisdom. The first references to his healing abilities occurred even later, from the 4th century B.C., a thousand and two hundred years after his death. At this point, he had become a patron of physicians so it is not impossible that Imhotep did indeed conduct research or compile texts 
in the field of medicine, and maybe this memory would have been passed on over centuries. However, to Egyptologists, the more likely explanation is that his figure was adopted much later by priests and medical doctors to turn his name which they knew was a name of a real person who had existed and a prominent man of this time into their divine holy patron. He was also later credited for inventing the mummification rituals which were so important to the Egyptians. This is unproven. But what is proven is that the Egyptians were the first to create what we would call a public health service. There were institutions called houses of life, where people could go to be examined and offered treatment by physicians, the kind of equivalent for the living of the house of the dead, where bodies were prepared for their burial. Overall, in antiquity, especially in the late antiquity. It seems that Egyptians were renowned for their good health relative to other peoples. There are Greek authors such as Herodotus who mention that Egypt's health system and medical knowledge may have contributed to its advanced medical practices or should it be attributed to the climate of Egypt, which is predominantly dry? Or the fact that people were generally well-nourished, which are important factors? It is hard to know. It is difficult to determine the exact cause. But considering the era in which they lived, the Egyptians were likely quite advanced in the field of medicine. They even performed surgeries and trepanation, which were considered risky and were at last resort. But the existence of ancient texts and preserved remains of individuals buried during that time indicate that some patients survived these procedures and continued living. Moreover, the Egyptians possessed a few highly effective drugs particularly potent painkillers. They knew about preparing basic opioids, for instance. Now, in the second millennium B.C., as the figure of Imhotep was rising in Egypt, another region of the world where complex medical practices were developed was India. Several texts containing prescriptions of herbs for ailments and dealing with medicine in general appeared in the second millennium. There are parts of the Vedas. I told you about the Vedas recently in a story about the history of Buddhism. You can locate it in my library. That were ancient Indian texts that still serve as a reference, especially in Hinduism, in the 7th and 6th centuries B.C. The synthesis of traditional herbal practices with a lot of theoretical elaboration about the human mind and supernatural forces gave birth to a new medicine system called Ayurveda. Veda means knowledge in Sanskrit, and Ayurveda means complete knowledge for long life. It has become famous, including outside of India, as the traditional Indian medicine. Actually, there were other schools in the past. For example, in medieval times, another form of medicine called Unani was introduced by Muslim sovereigns to India. It had Persian and Arab influences, but Ayurveda and Unani had similarities in their approach to hell and its preservation or restoration. 
illness or any kind of health problem, according to them, is not the product of malevolent spirits or divine influence, as we saw for mental illness in Mesopotamia. They came from imbalances between elements in someone's body. Ancient Ayurveda considered that the traditional elements of earth, fire, air, and water, were present in all bodies. But the elements that cause imbalances are not these. They are called doshas. These doshas are three different categories of substances that are believed to be present in any person's system. These three elements are called wind, bile, and phlegm. They would fluctuate in the body according to the seasons, the time of the day, the process of digestion, and other factors, thereby determining changing conditions of growth, aging, health, or disease. Now, the balance of these three categories would be different for each person depending on one's constitution, and the constitution of a person derives from factors like the parents and the time of conception. Someone's constitution is not just physical. It also includes the mind. A comparison between this three dasha theory and a European theory of the past called humorism can be made. We will talk about humorism extensively later. The two systems have different assumptions and a completely different history, but they have in common the conception that health, good or bad, results from the presence of different principles in the body, and that the cause of illness is an imbalance between these principles or elements. In this approach, the goal of medicine, whether as a prevention or a cure for an existing disorder, is to preserve or restore the balance between doshas according to a particular person's needs. Modern medicine considers the basis of Ayurveda to be pseudoscientific because the doshas are not quantifiable. It is not possible to observe or measure them or explain a logical interaction between them and the health situation of a person. However, despite this, it would be restrictive to limit Ayurveda or traditional Indian medicine to a set of unprobable hypotheses that were formulated more than 2,000 years ago because the texts they are based on also defend a lot of principles and categories that are relevant to modern medicine. Ancient Ayurveda Texts also taught surgical techniques based on a quite pertinent knowledge of anatomy, including, for example, how to extract kidney stones or foreign objects from someone's body. Ayurvedic therapies, which typically include herbal medicines, diets, massage, or yoga, also seem to emphasize the connection between body and mind. And this is not just magical thinking. It is a known fact that, at the very least, one can affect the other. These are not completely separate entities. The placebo effect, that is, the possibility that a substance or a treatment that has no measurable impact on people's bodies can help improve their health when they think it is an effective medicine, 
is a strong clue that the state of mind and the kind of faith can have physical biochemical consequences. This is why, in a clinical study, the efficiency of a treatment is always measured against a placebo, because if it doesn't do better than the placebo, then the molecule or the treatment is probably not having any positive impact. Now, continuing with these ancient traditional medicines, another famous one is the Chinese tradition. But, a bit like saying that Ayurveda is the one Indian traditional medicine, saying that there is one traditional Chinese medicine is a bit misleading. For a very long time, there were a variety of healing practices, herbal remedies, and beliefs that sometimes competed against each other in China. In the early 20th century, there was a cultural war in Chinese medical circles. Cultural and political modernizers worked to eliminate traditional practices based on the grounds that they were backward or unscientific. It didn't make them disappear, but it led to a reaction from traditional practitioners who selected elements of philosophy and practice and organized them into a system that they called Chinese medicine. And it is this system that is usually called traditional Chinese medicine. It is traditional in the sense that it is based on much more ancient practices and approaches, but it doesn't mean that there was a unified system before. That being said, what these many regional or local healing practices had in common was a philosophy derived from empirical observation and principles of Taoist physicians starting more than 2,000 years ago. A fundamental belief in this system is that of causality. It is believed that there is a natural order of the universe, a balance, and everything that happens to humans, including health problems, is a product of causes and effects that stem from the perturbation of this natural order. So, in this system, a physical or mental disorder has causes that can be physical or spiritual, and what we call disease is a manifestation, not the problem itself. So treatments are attempts at restoring balance. In that sense, there is something in common with Indian traditions, even though the nature of this imbalance is looked at differently, from a different angle. Chinese practitioners developed, like other traditions, a range of herbal and animal recipes for preparations, diet and exercise recommendations, but also types of therapies that are very particular, like moxibustion and acupuncture. Moxibustion is not as famous as acupuncture. It consists of burning dried mugwort on particular points of the body. Mugwort is a kind of flowering plant. The belief behind it, which is similar to the starting point of ancient acupuncture, is that every living person possesses vital force or chi. This chi circulates through the body on invisible paths called meridians, and to ensure good health, this energy has to circulate freely. Moxibustion was believed to facilitate or unblock the circulation of vital force, the blockages being the cause of various conditions. 
it is on the same theoretical basis that acupuncture was invented. And it is a very old practice that we have traces of in the second century BC. But here, instead of burning dried plants, needles were used to stimulate certain specific points of the body. Now, acupuncture is not a unified discipline. Like many Chinese concepts and practices of all sorts, it was exported to its Asian neighbors, so there is a variety of theoretical justifications for them at this point. The original concept of circulation of the vital force through meridians is no longer necessarily the basis of all these different practices of acupuncture. But after centuries and centuries, it is still widely used in China with needles, and generally, but more rarely through massage or pressures applied to certain points. It has also had some success in Western countries as well, where it is often used to attempt pain relief. There is so much to say about Chinese medicine, but to continue with our review, let's return to ancient Greece and Rome. In the second half of the first millennium BC, important evolutions took place. The Greeks from the classical period and before practiced a mix of magic or faith-based rituals and herbal, mineral, or animal treatments. They had a healer god named Asclepius, the son of the god Apollo. But he was not the only health-related god in Greek mythology and religion. He had several daughters, including Hygieia, the goddess of cleanliness. Her name evolved into the word hygiene. Another daughter was Asesso, the goddess of well-being and healing process. Additionally, they had Panacea, the goddess of supposed universal remedy. There were more daughters and sons. Asclepius may not be the most famous of Greek gods. He doesn't play a significant role in mythological stories. However, his symbol, the rod of Asclepius, a snake entwined around a twin staff, has become a symbol of medicine today. Temples of Asclepius were the closest thing the Greeks had to hospitals or the Egyptian houses of life. People visited them for medical advice and healing. But as in other fields, the Greeks went a bit further in their endeavors. More than other civilizations, they not only practiced medicine but also categorized, theorized, and searched for logical explanations with the freedom of thought and expression that other cultures did not necessarily have. As a result, their culture produced a number of physicians who sought not only to practice, but to develop and advance medicine. The most prominent of these physicians is undoubtedly Hippocrates. His name remains attached to the Hippocratic Oath that physicians in the Western countries take. The modern text of the Hippocratic Oath is not an exact translation of the ancient Greek text. Modern physicians are not going to swear to ancient gods. That would be absurd. But... The spirit of respecting one's office, of respecting the patient, and avoiding harm. These are principles that were put in writing many centuries ago. 
Apart from the oath, why is Hippocrates so important? Because with his followers, his students, he was the first to describe many diseases and medical conditions. They categorized illnesses in a way that is still very relevant today, using terms like acute, chronic, endemic, and epidemic. He introduced terms to describe the stages of pathology's evolution, such as crisis, peak, and convalescence. Hippocrates also emphasized the need to gather as much information as possible from the patient, not just about how they felt or where it hurt, but also about their activities where they had gone, what they had eaten, because all of this could provide valuable clues for a diagnosis or certain useful information that would connect to certain condition with pathologies. In his thought process, there was a sense of curiosity and questioning of past certainties, or established theories, a mindset shared by various Greek thinkers. They believed that the pursuit of improvement was a never-ending process and that things were not necessarily good just because they were ancient. This type of mindset was much less prevalent in ancient Egypt, for example. But Hippocrates, who lived between the 5th and the 4th centuries BC, also had other important Greek successors. Two of them were Herophilus of Chalcedon and Eresistratus of Sios. They lived in Alexandria in the 3rd century BC, that is, in Greek ruled Egypt after. Alexander the Great. The two of them led the foundations for the scientific study of anatomy and physiology in the 3rd century BC, and they did so by systematically performing dissections of bodies. In antiquity, be it for the Greeks or the Romans, this procedure was taboo and socially unacceptable including for medical reasons. But, punctually, there was a temporary lifting of the ban in Alexandria, and they took advantage of this to further their research. The inside of a human body was not that mysterious at the time. Thousands of years before them, the Egyptians were already masters at mummifying bodies, and this meant opening them and taking out their organs. So they knew what was inside of a body. But the Egyptians never actually mapped the human body in its details, like the vascular system or the connections between organs. And they had little interest in discovering how they worked, when people were alive. Their physicians had empirical knowledge of how it worked, but never studied it like a kind of living machine, the way the Greek scholars did. And this opened an entire set of new questions. What is the difference between life and death? Are there parts of the body that control others? What is the nature of the connection between the material, the mind, or the soul, and this flesh and bone organism? Yet another major Greek figure is Galen, who lived in the second century AD under the Roman Empire. He researched more anatomy and practiced dissection on dead animals with the goal of later understanding the human body. 
He also traveled a lot around the Mediterranean Sea within the empire to be exposed to a wide variety of medical theories and discoveries. Afterward, he settled in Rome, so his work provided a synthesis of medical knowledge in the Roman and Greek worlds in the second century AD. It was very influential for more than a thousand years in Western European, Islamic, and Byzantine universities. He became the reference for medieval physicians. Like most Greek and Roman physicians since Hippocrates, he believed in the theory of humorism, which was highly influential for a long time. It began to fall out of favor only in the 19th century due to several new discoveries that we will talk about later. But before that, even 2,000 years after Hippocrates, humorism was still the system that medical students learned in European universities. So what was humorism? It was the belief that human behavior and health were regulated by humors, chemical elements present in various proportions in our bodies. This intuition is probably more ancient than the Greek classical era. It could have roots in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Initially, these different humors were the fundamental elements, air, earth, fire, water, and sometimes others like metal. Hippocrates is credited with applying these concepts, this idea, to medicine. We are not 100% sure it was him, but at least it emerged at the time of his life among Greek physicians except Hippocrates dropped the fundamental elements when it came to health and replaced them with bodily fluids. He distinguished four of them, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Together with other physicians, he theorized that an excess or deficiency of any of these four humors could be the cause of illness. This theory spread to many scholars and was almost universally accepted in the Greek and then the Roman world. At the time of Galen, centuries after Hippocrates, it was considered solid. He also believed in it and he was very influential on medical teachings for centuries, as I said before. So this theory remained almost unquestioned until modern times. Humorism went even beyond illness. Some European scholars in the 17th and 18th centuries believed, for example, that humors determined the temperament, the personality of people depending on the proportions of these humors in their system. There were different archetypal temperaments, phlegmatic, sanguine, choleric, and melancholic, depending on the dominant humor in a person. And this could have even influenced the way they looked, with different body types and bone structure of their face, it may make a smile nowadays, but it was very serious back then. Some medical practices, like bloodletting, were based on humorism. There was a belief that reducing the quantity of blood in someone's system was a way of rebalancing humors. Some physicians had observed that bloodletting could make the temperature drop, and so fever could drop for all the wrong reasons because 
it weakened the body. But from that, they concluded that bloodletting helped rebalance and improve the health of someone. Humorism was quickly abandoned in the 19th century when the germ theory and other medical discoveries made it unsustainable. But before that, for more than 2,000 years, it remained the dominant medical theory in European medicine. Now, returning to the end of antiquity, the dislocation of the Western Roman Empire and after that, the shrinking of the Eastern Empire, Byzantine, led to relative decline in the study and practice of medicine north of the Mediterranean Sea. It would be exaggerated to say that no progress was made at all, but the practice of research was almost abandoned for centuries. There were no centers of teaching until medieval universities appeared. So healing returned to being a very decentralized kind of practice, and a lot of antique theories of anatomical knowledge and the practice of complex surgery were almost entirely lost to medieval Europe until the end of the Middle Ages when research resumed in universities, especially in Italy. As I said before, the Romans and the Greeks generally banned the dissection of human bodies, and it was taboo to them. Apart from a few exceptions and a temporary lifting of the ban in Alexandria, for example, and obviously there were people discreetly and illegally engaging in it, which made research in anatomy complicated. This ban continued during medieval times, but was lifted in Italy during the late Middle Ages. Additionally, contacts with Byzantium intensified, particularly via Venice and slowly medicine regained the scholarly dimension it had lost. In medieval Europe, especially in villages and hamlets where 90% of the people lived, the central figures when it came to health were herbalists and midwives, sometimes the same person. They had knowledge of plant remedies transmitted orally and empirically and they helped women give birth. In larger towns and cities, there were health institutions, most of the time paid for and run by the church. In the early Middle Ages, the one area where ancient medicine was preserved and perfected was the Islamic world. Islam had spread rapidly from Arabia and came into contact with a variety of different cultures that all had long medical traditions. Greece, Rome, Persia, and soon after the north of India. Muslim physicians adopted all these different legacies. The theory of humorism of Hippocrates and Galen was embraced and in the relatively liberal atmosphere of the 8th to the 11th centuries in the Muslim world, they contributed to bettering this legacy to complement it, partly with research. For example, in optics, the human eye was studied in detail, and for the first time, the reactions of the eye to light were systematically studied. At the time, the most complicated types of surgeries took place in Muslim institutions. Another aspect was more empirical, and they made a significant contribution to the expansion of hospitals. They observed, without knowing exactly why at the time, that cleanliness, hygiene, 
and the separation of patients greatly improved survival or recovery rates. This knowledge was applied to the most developed hospital system in the world. The hospital became a typical institution of Muslim cities. Like in Christendom, hospitals were generally attached to religious institutions, but there were many more of them, and in general they separated the practice of religious activity from the practice of medicine. And so, the physician became a renowned physician in Muslim societies, from Spain to India, at a time when trained physicians were quite rare in Europe. Both north and south of the Mediterranean, medical remedies used all kinds of herbs and minerals. But during the Middle Ages, the importance of exotic spices in these recipes rose quite a lot. This is one of the reasons why spices were so sought after and expensive. They were attributed with all sorts of virtues that made people less sensitive to the prices. They kept buying whatever the cost. Now that we have provided a quick overview of some ancient medical traditions, a question arises, did they work or not? They certainly saved people by giving them a chance to receive care and could alleviate pain. Additionally, there was always the placebo effect mentioned earlier, so yes, these traditions improved people's quality of life at least to some extent. However, when looking at the world's life expectancy, it is difficult to observe significant progress over time. Of course, we do not have precise statistics that historians and demographers agree on, but life expectancy appears to have remained relatively stable in every region of the world from prehistory to the 18th century. Depending on the region, life expectancy at birth ranged between 26 and 35 years, which is not very high. Moreover, there was a significant amount of infant mortality. For those who survived their early years, life expectancy was probably closer to 40 years or 45 years. It is worth noting that this could have been even lower without any medical interventions. But it seems that despite progress in knowledge, such as anatomy, remedies, and health policies, these advances did not translate into significant gains in life expectancy. The dramatic increase in life expectancy worldwide occurred in the 19th century, likely attributable to various factors such as improved hygiene, access to better food, and advancements in general material conditions. Additionally, the introduction of vaccines, surgery, and antibiotics played a crucial role in this improvement. Many of these aspects are related to medicine or closely connected to medical advancements, and they can be attributed to the introduction of modern science into the field of medicine. But before it bore tangible fruits, it is essential to note that the revolution and progress in medicine began earlier, in the 16th century, in the wake of the Renaissance. So let's look at this. As you know, the Renaissance brought an intense focus on scholarship to Europe. Scholarship rather than science in the modern sense. The initial appetite of Renaissance scholars was more to discover or rediscover ancient knowledge texts and viewpoints. 
So there was a major effort to translate texts into Latin from Greek or Arabic, which provided a foundation on which scholars could systematically investigate on a scale that might never have existed before in human history. This questioning extended to distrusting or trying to validate traditional practices, and this was very important, because some established medical practices were actually harmful. For example, there were a few effective drugs, but also a lot of folklore cures or metal-based compounds used at treatments that were actually poisonous. For several generations, this still did not provide much improvement in life expectancy, but several groundbreaking discoveries were made. They include the discovery of nerves and a new discipline, neurology, by Italian and French scholars of the 16th century. In England, in the 17th century, the correct circulation of blood was described for the first time. It was something that antique anatomy had not figured out. Also in the 17th century, the first microscopes permitted the discovery of bacteria. The first observation was made in the Netherlands, and it initiated the field of microbiology. Like in other fields of science, there was a growing separation between scientific research, scientific teaching, and religion. It didn't go without conflicts, but it was achieved. And from the 18th century, and even more so in the 19th century, scientific research became fully autonomous and independent from churches and religious precepts. Things were changing in societies. Science became held in high esteem socially, especially from the 18th century at the time of Enlightenment. For physicians, becoming more scientific was a way of upgrading their social status, because at that time, discoveries did not necessarily spread instantly. They did circulate within elite circles in each country, but there were barely any public health policies. And the health field was also very crowded with all sorts of practitioners. There were self-trained barbers practicing surgery. The two professions often came together. There were many apothecaries, some of whom were just charlatans selling miracle drugs. Still, plenty of midwives, who were the only health workers in villages, had no training. They learned from their mothers and from experience. The long process of professionalization began in cities of Italy, Germany, France, England, and all over Europe, basically. The oldest functioning hospitals often date back from the 16th to the 18th centuries when this process began. The first modern hospitals were generally also centers of education for health workers, from physicians to nurses. The main discovery that emerged from the 18th century is probably the realization that hygiene was crucial. This is something that had intuitively been guessed in various parts of the world, dating back to antiquity. I told you earlier about the Greek goddess of hygiene, who was identified with good health, or Islamic hospitals of the Middle Ages, but it was discovered that it could extend to food preparation and conservation, and to surgery. Some of the most powerful and effective new techniques of the 19th century were actually the development of aseptic operating theaters, antiseptics, bacteriology, and germ theory. 
Anesthesia was also developed in the 19th century. But let's take things in order, beginning with maybe the most life-changing discovery, bacteriology and germ theory. I mentioned before that the discovery of the existence of living microorganisms is dated to the 17th century with the first microscopes. 19th century scientists pushed this much further with a series of discoveries. First, in the 1830s, they found that microorganisms were responsible for alcoholic fermentation, which had been known and used for millennia but never explained before. Around 1850, the humorous theory began to lose ground because it had been observed that basic hygiene measures could dramatically improve death rates. For example, physicians or midwives attending childbirth never wash their hands with soap until then. It sounds dreadful, but nobody even thought about it. The major factor of mortality for mothers back then was infections caused by giving birth. This is called childbed fever but it was believed that infections were caused by so-called miasmas, like odors that travel in the air. No one believed that infections could be transmitted by dirty hands of health professionals. In 1987, an Australian physician realized that the death rate of mothers could be dramatically reduced just by this simple measure of cleaning one's hands However, it took several years before the measure spread because people would just not believe this. But the germ theory was about to revolutionize medicine, and it started with a French scientist, Louis Pasteur. He met the hypotheses that these microorganisms responsible for alcoholic fermentation, which were now well known, may also be the cause of contagious diseases. A few years later, a British surgeon, Joseph Lister, took this hypothesis seriously and introduced antisepsis. Antisepsis, which is the elimination of microorganisms, revealed that alcohol was an effective antiseptic for wound treatment. Lister realized that this dramatic reduction in the occurrence and intensity of infections could be attributed to the use of alcohol as an antiseptic. Elaborating on Pasteur's discoveries, the German physician Robert Koch laid the foundation of the germ theory of disease by cultivating bacteria and inoculating them to test animals. This experimentation proved that a living organism could be contaminated by bacteria and develop a disease. This launched a race to isolate and discover the bacteria, the germs, responsible for different diseases. In 1881, Koch discovered that bacterium responsible for tuberculosis, which cemented the germ theory. Another innovation derived from bacteriology and the discovery of the role of microorganisms was vaccination. This effort was also led by Pasteur, who introduced a rabies vaccine. Now vaccination had an ancestor inoculation. It was not known why, but it had been observed, generations earlier, that people could be infected with a small quantity of germs from a sick person, resulting in the development of a mild version of the disease, recover, and would no longer be at risk of developing it again. They had gained immunity. Although it was risky, it generally improved life expectancy. 
in some royal families of the 18th century, smallpox inoculation was practiced. The reasons behind its effectiveness were unknown since contagious diseases like smallpox were attributed to miasmas. But what vaccination did was make the process of gaining immunity more systematic and less risky. Because a weakened pathogen was injected, which dramatically reduced the risk of contracting a serious form of the disease. These examples of Koch and Pasteur reflect the increasing role of science in medicine and the huge benefits of finding applications for fundamental research. It continued in the 20th century with many more groundbreaking innovations that we don't have time to deal with tonight, but they include antibiotics, antivirals, blood transfusions, and medical imaging. Thanks to research in physics on X-rays and waves, we have made significant advancement in these areas. Furthermore, the discovery of active molecules from chemical research has given birth to new families of drugs. However, the evolution of medicine is not solely based on discoveries. It also entails infrastructure and social change, especially regarding professionalization. This applies not only to physicians, but also to all medical personnel. Another important figure from the 19th century in this context is Florence Nightingale, who can be considered the founder of modern nursing. Until the 19th century, personnel in European hospitals were primarily composed of nuns and helpers, with the majority of them being women, but they lacked medical training and instead learned on the job from their colleagues and personal experiences. Their training primarily encompassed methods of physical care, while they received no education on actual medicine. For women, becoming physicians was exceedingly difficult until relatively recently, even until the 20th century. It was socially unacceptable and, paradoxically, women had been providing medical support as midwives and healers for centuries. Nonetheless, with the advent of professionalization in health, professions during the 19th century, women were sidelined. They were denied the opportunity to study medicine and instead were channeled into roles as medical housekeepers, lacking formal training and legitimacy to make decisions. Florence Nightingale was born into a wealthy, well-connected British family, which meant she received a good education. She also became a statistician, but she came to prominence while serving as a manager and trainer of nurses during the Crimean War. The war opposed Russia to a coalition led by Great Britain and France, with the intention of blocking Russian expansionists' views against the Ottoman Empire. Most of the fighting took place between an Anglo-French expedition and the Russian army in Crimea. That's how a British nurse participated in this war. Casualties in this war were horrendous. It was one of the first industrial wars occurring a few years before the American Civil War. Apart from the fighting, another cause of mortality was disease due to the high concentration of men in poor hygiene conditions. During this conflict, Florence Nightingale organized care for soldiers and her image of dedication gave nursing a favorable reputation. 
As a result, she became very popular in Victorian society and was regarded as a consensual and positive figure. But Nightingale went beyond her nursing efforts during the war. She used her image and connections to professionalize nursing. In 1860, she established a nursing school, which was the first secular institution of its kind in the world. This not only inspired the creation of many more nursing schools worldwide, but also elevated the status of nurses as medical professionals able to actively contribute to patient treatment and take initiative. Additionally, it expanded the acceptable form of female participation in the workforce. Nonetheless, barriers still existed for women in the medical world. It is now commonplace to find women among physicians, and no one is surprised by that. However, until the 1970s in Europe and North America, it was very rare for women to have a prominent role in the medical field. Only in the past few decades have women been able to fully integrate into all professions within the medical world. Apart from her role in the professionalization of nurses, Florence Nightingale is also a multifaceted character. She was an activist who worked for hunger relief in India. She advocated social reforms to improve health care for all sections of the British society. And she was a gifted mathematician. She developed the use of pie charts to present statistics, for example, something that was not done before. The first pie charts appeared at the beginning of the 19th century, but she adapted them to make them easily readable. The spectacular development of modern medicine was just beginning at the dawn of the 20th century, and there would be much more to say about this, from surgery to drugs, transplants, and new forms of therapies or vaccines. But for tonight, we have reached the end of this overview, and you can now let go and fall asleep or pick another story if you wish. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well.